Well, hello, uh, M. Hotep, and welcome. I'm Mog Morgan, uh, companion of Set and Knight of Shambhala, and this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. So for today, I'm giving another episode of a, a sequence I call Alistair Crowley's Egypt, <laughs> and this time dealing with the concept of heaven and hell. Uh, which I don't know where I had the idea for that. I think it figures quite a lot in Crowley's kind of mindset, really. And maybe it's just a coincidence as well that on the uh, social media, I see such a lot of stuff about. Mainly, I suppose, from the kind of resurgent atheists going on about Christianity concept of heaven and hell. It made me think, Actually, the concept of heaven and hell you probably it is supposed to be Egyptian. Uh, so I thought, is there some way I can link this in with Crowley's view of Egypt? And of course, there are lots of different connections here. Uh, famously, Crowley's own mother called him the Beast. Uh, that's the Beast, not just a Beast. Uh, I suppose you could imagine someone calling their kid a beast occasionally. Uh, they're a bit naughty, but the beast. Um, I think she means he was some sort of incarnation or something from the Bible, which was very important to to her. And of course, the beast, you say she was obsessed. Well, they were, they were kind of obsessed with the Bible. The beast that, that she's talking about is the beast 666 from the final book of the Christian Bible, which in the end, I, I, I don't know if he's just making this up, but uh, it was an archetype, the beast, that, of course, he embraced. And he knew a lot about it. It was quite an imp always part of his psyche that he didn't completely let go. He was brought up, as you maybe know, in a, a Christian fundamentalist sect so that fundamentalism is a kind of tendency in lots of different religions but is mainly known from christianity in which um they claim to have a kind of more fundamental view going back to some original uh version of a of a religion it's a little bit of a kind of put up job i i, I think and Nobody ever really quite goes back to that, but it, it's usually associated with a quite a, a conservative, literal view of one's religion. Uh, and there are particular sects or types of Christianity that seem to be close to this fundamentalist idea. Uh, there are a number of books you can look at if you want to kind of look at the philosophy of fundamentalism, which, uh, as say, you, you get in other places. But... He was in a fundamentalist sect known as the Plymouth Brethren, uh, which, which again is an interesting group. It's got a kind of dark side, as often these groups do, but it's probably also, despite this kind of very restrictive, I'd say, philosophy that fundamentalist sects tend to have, or, or perhaps, I don't know if you say despite or because of, and perhaps despite, if you like, this particular sect has a number of different celebrities over the years or well-known philosophers who were members of the sect. And this is seen as quite a surprising thing, really, that such liberal and open-minded people would come from such a closed mind sect. Now, Broly is the most, probably the most famous of the uh, people who originate from the Plymouth Brethren uh, and people make quite a lot of this kind of angst in his soul that maybe comes from that background. There's a quite an interesting novel uh, called Father and Son by Edmund Goss in which he writes about his father who was a famous geologist we're also a fundamentalist Christian, and you can see how there might be a certain tension between the study of geology in which you show that the world is many, many millennia, many 
billions of years old, judging by the the patterns in the rocks. But at the same time, you, you believe in this holy book that tells you it's only whatever it might be, 11,000 years old, which why is uh, why is this kind of contradiction between your scientific point of view and, and what this fundamentalist sect teaches about the Bible? And that's quite an interesting thing. And Edmund Goss wrote about his relationship with his father, who was very, very much more strict in that view, and as well worth checking out. And you'd say that, given you have that sort of background, it wouldn't be surprising that Crowley created, or ch when he channeled his own religion or spiritual path, which uh, we know as Salema, you can detect the this radical Christian upbringing in a lot of the ideas that were important to him, and he kind of wove into a, a, his own religious and spiritual path uh and in fact he wrote he, he wrote one book actually directly about christianity uh, uh attempting to kind of characterize its uh historical sort of significance this is the book uh, actually it's published as a book called crowley on christ i think it was originally the uh gospel of George Bernard Shaw, who was a contemporary of Crowley's, who, who had an attitude about early Christianity that it was some sort of uh, proto-socialist uh, revolutionary sect, uh, which was George Bernard Shaw's thing that he kind of reflected in a, a number of his plays. And Crowley obviously didn't like that idea and published this polemic essentially against George Bernard Shaw, in which he tried to show that actually Christianity was quite, even early Christianity was, or Jesus himself fits into a quite, a, what he saw as quite a conservative pattern of a religious teacher in the classical world. I don't think he was right about that necessarily, but it's an interesting that he thought it was important enough to write a whole book about it. So it was obviously important to him, and he, he, he considered himself to know, knew a lot about it. But, the, of course, the Christian book that figures the most in Crowley's philosophy would be uh, the one we know as the New Testament book of Revelation. It's interesting that, that kind of Crowley had this thing that he called the steli of revealing. Uh, so this idea of revelation and revealing, again, it would be in the back of his mind. Anyway, this book, would be the last book the final book of the of the christian bible and out of that he kind of wove and developed a whole magical philosophy in some ways um it, I, I think you'd have to say crowley doesn't have one unified view there's several different views that seem to be side by side that can sort of ebb, ebb and flow throughout his work but certainly the the philosophy, the idea of the beast again, the beast six 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 as a kind of male archetype, and this other figure of uh, I don't know, I suppose you would say now a, a goddess, the goddess ba Babylon, although there is no goddess Babylon in the, in the ancient world, there'd be the goddess of Babylon. But it's one of the features of the book of Revelation that it kind of personified the goddess of this this place, Babylon, uh, as, as this figure who would, both of them would return at the end of the world, at the end of times, and somehow there'd be this interaction between them. And you can see how there might be interesting interaction. There's the male and female figures who, if you kind of re deconstruct something or reverse something so even though they're seen as kind of quite negative but are saying and glamorous figures in this book of revelation uh you could say from taking a magical point of view or even a tantric point of view they they are actually the most interesting characters and and have the most useful things to teach us about the nature of human 
nature itself and and what the future holds for us so this is a a big role I should say that Babylon, I think I'm right in saying for Crowley, he corrected the spelling. Babylon, the city, is spelt one way. <coughs> and Babylon, the goddess, is spelt slightly differently for some sort of esoteric re uh, reasoning to do with Crowley's view of numerology and uh, symbolism of words and all the rest. So whether she's... You could, uh, you, people have different approaches to this. They either see her as, as a representation of the ancient goddess, which is like the goddess, say, Anana or whatever, or Astarte of uh, ancient Babylonia, or I, as I would say, the, the goddess Hathor, or Isis and Nuit. All of these goddesses in the Egyptian tradition have something like this uh, figure of elevated womanhood and uh, and of the goddess that's probably what they're talking at, at is it, so the, the things that the this this christian text doesn't really like is actually one of the best things about ancient mythology and something that really needs to come back in so this is the book of revelation that uh, was so important this is an example of what's known as apocalyptic literature literature to do with the end of the world the end of the world and the beginning of a new one and this is a important idea the end of the world in christianity or certain types of christianity especially this fundamentalism who were very very focused on the end times but also i think you'd say for crowley was very into the idea of a, an apocalypse and the end of days uh, but and the beginning of a new eon that's the way he would see it in esoteric ways uh apparently there were quite a lot of pieces of literature like this in the ancient world in the roman times that they could have chosen and so the book of revelation is in a sense also a representative example of, of uh, apocalyptic literature that the compilers of the bible thought should be represented in, in uh, as the end point in the text which is interesting in its own right so but the interesting thing to me is that this book the book of revelations uh, on apocalyptic literature there are several roads and ways through it that that do it also lead us directly back to the philosophy and uh, spirituality of ancient Egypt. Uh, and maybe that is not so well known. And I thought that would be an interesting thing to explore. And there's actually quite a lot to explore in terms of the uh, Egyptian background to the Book of Revelation, but also the Egyptian background to the Book of Revelation as it ends up in the work of Aleister Crowley. So this is an aspect of Alistair Crowley's notions and riffs and raps on the on the notion of heaven and hell uh, in the ancient world, <clears throat> which, as I say, is not a purely Christian concept, but is is something in itself that is very central to Egyptian religion. So. I wrote about this in a few different places. In the book, the compilation that I put together uh, by Netta, which is about a, another name for the magical power of Egypt, I talk about um, a thing called the, the characters, these, um, or symbols. So at the end of Egyptian culture <laughs> in the Roman period when Egyptian uh, the pharaonic culture for want of a better word was in some sort of decline and the as I say say for instance is ruled ruled by the Greek last Greek pharaohs the Greeks who had taken over I think only Cleopatra even knew the Egyptian language the other uh, previous pharaohs 
they they didn't know the Egyptian language at all and, and didn't really rely on Egyptian authorities, but she did. I mean, this is, she's returning in a way. But whatever. So at the end of the development of the Egyptian culture, a very interesting thing happens in in that they kind of the hieroglyphic signs morph and, and turn into a series of what we would maybe recognize as sigils. Uh, the technical name they have is characters, uh, which are kind of, I suppose you'd say pseudo hieroglyphs. They often are hieroglyphs, but you can't really make a an Egyptian word out of them. Uh, I gave an example in the previous broadcast about the the eye of Horus, for instance, uh, being used in a, in one of these late spells. But the word that it spelt out with the others, it didn't really make sense grammatically within the uh, Egyptian language. But as uh, signs of kind of emotions, emotive signs, they did make sense and they did fit with the with the, the, the thing that the spell was trying to do. So th these sigils or signs are this late last development, one of the last developments of the Egyptian language. And in the collection of the Greek magical papyri that does the rounds, interestingly, to give us a link back to the Book of Revelation, there are said to be, uh, or there's a spell in which it talks about the seven characters or sigils, seven characters of deliverance. So it boils it all down again. There are millions of these uh, thousands of these signs or whatever, but uh, that you can take a group of seven and call them your seven basic signs for deliverance. Uh, so even though the total number of characters is very large, uh, you could just have it seven of them, or, or there's a, a manipulation of seven. And seven, as we've mentioned many times, is a very, very important number within the Egyptian tradition and within magic in itself. So ironically, sometimes you call them the seven, even if there might be eight one of them might be repeated this is the irony but so seven is not just an actual number it's a kind of a symbolic number so i uh, say so the the seven appear now there's an idea later on this 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 concept is obviously doesn't go away it uh has a, an afterlife within the medieval world of in the middle east and you have a thing that is similar called the seven seals of usually you would say medieval islamic magic but uh actually the the seven seals are a blend of uh hebrew islamic and christian symbolism i think the first two of the seven seals are from the quran numbers three and four are from the new testament and the final three are from the Torah. So this is kind of interfaith stuff. So you've got your seven your seven seals of magic. <clears throat> well, then you've got famously in this book of Revelation, you've also got a mention of the seven seals uh, in the final book. In this apocalyptic text was written in the Roman era, uh, in the reign of Domitian, which is the first century of our era, written by a mystical person, a mystic, who calls himself John, a different John from the one of the Gospels, who's in exile, perhaps as a punishment, on the island of Patmos. And Elaine Pagels, uh, who's a big scholar of Gnosticism, says that the text of the uh, Book of Revelation is really a political text. Uh, it's some sort of cryptic attack upon the Roman Empire and the kind of things that they do. 
But even though she says that, she says it's not to deny that the seven seals, for instance, is not also got this resonance of uh, ancient magic. So in the book, uh, various things happen. The book of Revelation, to go back to that, and with, with the Babylon, and it's quite an elaborate mystical thing. Some of it you could take very literally as something that's going to happen at the end of the world. And some of it is an obvious set of uh, symbolic or magical ideas about the nature of the inner reality. And at some point, these figures appear with these these scrolls, these papyrus scrolls in the story, each, <clears throat> each one of which is... These figures appear with these scrolls, uh, which each one of which has a seal on it. And the, these these figures, the horsemen of the apocalypse or whatever, have to break the seal and open the scroll and read the, the little spell that's upon it. So I'm not going to treat you to the whole lot, but uh, this is very uh resonant of uh this magic of the greek magic uh magical papyri which are is on papyri the seals it all seems to be part of the same world view the first one and i saw in his right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the outside and sealed with the seven seals and then it goes on to describe the process of uh, breaking the seals now in the book of revelation it never actually gives the seals what they look like but you can assume that they're this these character things these late period hieroglyphs these sigils that appear in um, in in the in the magical papyri and i would say also move on to the seven seals of medieval islamic magic in which case the first seal rather appropriately is an inverted pentagram and then there's a kind of uh, a kind of poetic thing and i saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and i heard the noise of thunder one of the four beasts say come and see and i saw a white horse and he that sat on the horse had a bow and a crown and he went forth conquering and to conquer so and then it, and it goes on. It, even in its own right, it's kind of, if you forget all the kind of way people use this text, if you just see it as an example of a uh, a late classical magical text, then it, 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 it's got a lot of history. And I think this is the way Alistair Crowley would have uh, looked upon it. And this whole section of, uh, does have, you know, a continuation into into the magical tradition. Okay, so to continue with this idea that uh, about the apocalyptic literature, apart from these elements that I've identified as being from the magical tradition and a continuation in this sort of movement, these paths back and forth from the magical papyri of Egypt to the apocalyptic literature to medieval Islamic stuff, Another kind of link with Egypt would be the, the whole idea of uh, this of apocalyptic literature in itself anyway. And the precedent for books like the uh, Book of Revelation is an Egyptian text known as the Potter's Oracle or the Oracle of the Potter, which is from Hel what they call Hellenistic Egypt. Hellenistic is a kind of mildly put down in a way, right? It's saying you've got Hellenism and you've got Hellenistic, as I mentioned before. But forget that. It's interesting. The Hellenistic period is very, very creative. I don't really think we should accept the idea of these declines between these different periods. It, it, there's a change. Uh, it's 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 more diverse and very very creative but whatever way you look at it is an egyptian prophetic text a prophecy known as the oracle of the potter of which there are quite a lot of oracles and 
texts in this class, but this is the most well known. Uh, it was written in the Demotic language, or which again is a kind of development, a popular version of, of the Egyptian language the, in its last period. So thus, uh, it's get date of this text is given as the third century before the Christian era. So apocalyptic literature predates the Christian period. They're continuing the tradition. There are five different uh, versions of this document on papyrus that have survived, so you can presume there might be I mean, a few others. Uh, and uh, some of the manuscripts have been rewritten in later times, uh, it, depending when, when people need something like this. And the rewriting, texts like this tend to kind of coincide with a period of social change of uh desire for revolution or for uh, a a societal change so there you have the roman empire uh and it's sort of done away with the egyptian system there are no longer kings and people are uh from various sources are longing for a return to the to old Egypt, one way or another, and, and there are various attempts at rebellions, as there were in other areas of the uh, Roman Empire, with usually dire results, as we know. So every time there's a kind of rebellion gets going, um, we, we said it happened a few times, several times, there are usually bits of literature that are produced, propaganda, if you like, uh, to go with this, that kind of say, well, look, there's this text, the Oracle of the Potter, and the Potter is Kanum, who's the Potter God, and they're quite an important creator, so he's given this, this this status. And this Oracle, as you know, uh, as they say to people, it it predicts that uh, the that the end of the Romans essentially is gonna come. And it does this using a lot of Egyptian mythology, some of which is is a little bit pointed. So the, the potter is, is some sort of prophet uh, of what's coming. And also the potter is in the story. Uh, you know, as I say, Kanum is the lord of the potter's wheel, which is a, <coughs> who fashioned the world all of the world originally in Egyptian mythology. So essentially this is a piece of, this is before the Roman era as well, but it carries on, anti-Greek or anti-Ptolemaic propaganda in which the potter tells the king uh, Amenhotep, uh, who writes everything down and, and then reveals it to the people, telling them that the future chaos and destruction is going to follow because of the unfair and foreign rule of the worshippers of Set, who in this time are also known as the belt wearers, i.e. the Greeks. The Greeks, according to this oracle, have become, because they're sort of outsiders, therefore, the oracle proposes that they must be worshippers of Set or Typhon in the Greek tradition, which again is an interesting thing. Obviously, I'm a kind of quite into Set and everything, but it's interesting to see how these this mythology of of uh, Set and Horus, kind of the work it gets put to at various stages, and imputed to the Greeks who had indeed given the name of Typhon their own uh, chaotic god to the Egyptian god said. And it says that uh, they, they're going to, Alexandria, the city that the Greeks founded, or was founded in the name of Alexander the Great, is going to be deserted. They're going to get their comeuppance, uh, and they're going to fall upon each other and kill each other, and there's trouble times ahead. <coughs> and... Uh, the Egyptian gods are going to come back, to, and the capital is going to come back to Memphis. 
along with the Agatha Daemon or the it says Shai, the patron god <coughs> of Alexandria, which contradictory Shai is also a name of Set, so the the god, the serpent deity of Alexandria, worshipped by the by the the Greeks, will actually desert them. Seth will, in effect, desert them, and will return to uh, Memphis, which is uh, somewhere in the vicinity of modern Cairo. And the city of Alexandria is going to be abandoned. The great city will be no more. And Egypt will rise again. So there are lots of oracles like this. Now, this model of this apocalyptic fall of the, the city of the, of the empire is thought to be the model of the, the sort of literature you, you get in the... Um, in the book of revelation so there's a, a nice link link for you already well several links we've got the uh the whole story which is in a sense as well about heaven and hell isn't it it's about the kind of end of the world and the 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 the, the situation will exist before a final judgment uh on all this and all the things that have to play out in a complicated system and so you, I think you'd say the entire scenario of the of of the Book of Revelation is also not just because of the prophetic nature of it. It's also modelled on something that we uh, often allude to, which are these books of the underworld uh, or the underworld of the soul. Uh, or of the the so-called underworld books and the underworld books is a, a section of one of them shown behind me and maybe i'll show a few other sections essentially they tell a story which is is a kind of like a, a mixture between a prophecy but also the way things are which tells the story of the uh, of the progress of of a person usually well it can be a living person it can be a person who's just died who 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 makes this journey uh this this journey through various places and various things they have to learn uh until eventually they they reach they go to hell right they they travel into the lowest point of the underworld uh and they this so this is literally is the origin of the notion of of hell uh and it's shown as a fiery pit where those who have failed are eternally punished in, in one way or another but certainly this is i i think the egyptians saw this in a in a different way than the literal thing it's just part of of uh, the way the world is that you have to see this underworld space and they have an explanation of uh why this place came into existence so so to so know why this place existed uh you have to look at some other groups of texts i've laid some of this out in this little book that i've just produced called the uh egyptian genesis Egyptian Genesis, if you like, beginning of the Nephilim, though, because the, again, the the myth that you find within the Hebrew Bible or the beginning of the Bible is um, of these entities called the Nephilim. I argue in this book that you can also see traces of that or find a version of that within the Egyptian tradition, and interestingly. The creation of that, the moment in which that comes into existence. Okay, so the notion of the underworld, and especially of, of this place, uh, which has various sort of rooms in it, or caves or whatever, 
was in it uh, included in this place of punishment or, or where people are trapped if they can't continue with the journey would be another way of looking at it and this journey whether psychological or actual are happening post-mortem is, is is an incredibly important notion within <coughs> the way the Egyptians looked at things and in their temples they give this account of the beginning of the underworld of the soul as some sort of battle at the beginning of time between uh the forces of chaos and the forces of order so you can see how this might fit with the whole cosmology idea uh, in terms of practical work the, having some knowledge of the underworld books and using them as a kind of regular reading device and meditation or aid uh, on a long cycle because these books are quite long uh, and there are episodes within it that one is meant to dwell on but anyway the first in the story, in the, these stories that are laid out in usually in temple designs, the first sacred place was marked out on an island of sand. Which incidentally, many temples were actually uh, built on a foundation of sand, uh, even if this made them a little bit unstable. It's obviously important magical substance. Uh, Hence the kind of science of geomancy in which sand is used as a kind of divinatory device. So again, oracles, divination, these things overlap. Uh, so a place like the Temple of Seti the first at Abazos and its Osarion is also related to this kind of uh, underworld of the soul. Right, the underworld in one way it's a sort of physical representation of it in which important psychological and religious and magical things are said to take place its real name was what is serviceable to osiris meaning you know a place that is gonna he's gonna have to go there it's gonna have to be part of his resurrection and judgment uh so the temple is modeled on this underworld journey is as a living being, being able to respond to anybody who enters into it who, who, and uh, so it's part actual architecture and it's part psychological schema uh, in the first times it was the place where the the sanctified ruler the hekanetri or great magician resided so it's it's an important place psychologically and physical physically and it has lots of different places within it and interestingly from a from the Egyptian temple at edfu we learn that the generic the main name for this place was the underworld of the soul which came into existence as a result of the the battle or earlier battles that had taken place at the beginning of the world when this whole elaborate construction including hell for want of a they call it hell but this underworld fiery place put there for, in order for you to to know about but all, as a sort of obstacle an obstacle on your route to inner knowledge and and fulfillment one way or another so the two different realms the 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 physical world we live in and the underworld in which in this underworld people live permanently uh not very happily it has to be said in in the book when they get some relief from their dwelling as of uh, being stuck within the underworld when the sun god goes through when he leaves again and the sun fades and they're back in the darkness only illuminated by the fire that doesn't seem to warm them up very much they let out the most pitiful wails you know calls in one way or another 
So from the Egyptian point of view, the, the creation of the underworld and of the, the, this hell realm uh, as an obstacle or, or a place is, is not something that it, it's, it's put together as an idea almost as soon as any text, as soon as the Egyptians write any text about their world and the, the things within it, uh, starting for us, we learn about them in the pyramid text and the, the coffin text. Almost the first thing that they write about is the existence of this uh, underworld space and why it comes into existence and what it's actually for psychologically, one way or another. So the notion of heaven and hell uh, as a psychological journey uh, and test is there right from the beginning in uh, Egyptian thought and finds its way into uh, later Christian uh, thought primarily through things like the apocalyptic literature. So heaven and hell is important to all of these different paths and I'd say that's one way of looking at sort of Crowley's approach. I think this is Crowley's approach to the book of Revelation that he wove into his magical system, in that Crowley looked at it as a kind of version. Well, if he didn't, we're going to sort of say that it is as a version of an Egyptian book of the underworld, in which this kind of cryptic journey is, is laid out for people. So heaven and hell then are quite important to Egyptian thought, not something that is just a, uh, a kind of obsession of certain types of Christianity. It's, it's important. And it's funny how a lot of these concepts keep coming back to us anyway in terms of, obviously, as Elaine Pagel said, it's, it's, it's also a political thing and it's uh, all these uh things have politics and kind of has a way or history has a way of picking up some of these mythological themes uh and playing with them and this isn't just then it seems to still be happening now in the world in which we live but we won't concern ourselves too much of that we just need to as at least as magicians understand not a kind of simplistic way of looking at these things, but that it's not to scare people. People say, oh, they, somebody cooked up this idea of heaven and hell to just frighten people into a particular view. I, I think that's a little bit kind of simplistic. It's, it's, it's more like saying, well, the, the world is a complicated thing and so the, the the journey that that we make is quite full of pitfalls one way or another uh it's certainly not the creation of of, of only one religion it, this is a ancient revelation of the egyptians who had a way of uh of avoiding the falling into the pits of hell which is a gnostic way a way of knowledge uh and of understanding, of understanding that these things there, because this is the way that you will, rather than denying them, understanding them. And that is pretty much, I would say, the way Crowley approached the idea of heaven and hell, although sometimes he dressed it up. He liked the glamour of the, the scary aspects of it. And obviously there are lots of different sides to it once you know that and you realize that the books of the underworld from egypt are actually quite complicated and have lots of different things to say apart from the one that i focused on this time i think that would be the same in crowley's approach to the mysteries of the, the beast uh and of babylon and of, of the, the working out and the opening of the seven series.